Hi, I'm Carrie Brandenburg, Second Judicial District Attorney, and welcome to Full Disclosure with the District Attorney. Today we're going to talk about a topic that we haven't touched on yet, but it's extremely critical, and the President just came out with a report this month um, discussing it and the need for more awareness and certainly public education. I have as my guest Claire Harwell, who is an attorney and your project um, director with the Community Justice Project. Is that correct? That's right. And that's part of the um, New Mexico Coalition of Sexual Assault. That's group. correct. Okay. Yes. And exactly what do you do in that role dealing with issues related to sexual assault? The Community Justice Project is a federally funded project funded by a grant program called Legal Assistance for Victims. And it actually is one of the topics that was touched upon in President Obama's report yesterday. Okay. And what we do is we provide free civil legal services to sexual assault survivors who are assaulted as adults. And in the criminal context, we do very limited special appearances around issues relating to victim rights and privacy um, when, when there's a privacy controversy in a particular sexual assault case. Okay. Now, now we, we call, I mean, I, typically because I'm a prosecutor, my lingo is a rape victim. I know that lots of people in the field like to call them survivors um, because they actually survive and, and go on. Um, beyond what you know, the, the rape that they uh, experienced. So we'll use those terms interchangeably, but by using the term victim, I don't mean to diminish um, the survivors. What, you know, what is the status of sexual assault in New Mexico? We typically tend to be low in every category that's good and high in every category that's bad. And um, from our statistics, we are, a little, we are worse than average in terms of sexual assaults. That's right. Um, if the viewers go to our website, the New Mexico Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs, so it's nmcsap.org, uh, they can see annual reports on okay. what kind of reports have been made about sexual assault and also breakdowns of the various kinds of sex crimes, who seeks assistance, um, they can see a breakdown by county, and okay. that data is very specific, and it's collected through voluntary participation of um, the various entities that serve sexual assault survivors. So there's very specific data that's available okay. in our state, and that's something that we can be proud of because that's actually not available in a lot of other states. Right. But to go back to your original question, how do we compare to other states, um, the news in this category as the other categories that you mentioned is not Right. good. Right. Okay. We are in a situation where we have a disproportionate number of our children who are having this experience and that has consequences economically. It has consequences in terms of mental health, um, which is not to say that everyone who experiences a sexual assault as a child will then grow up to have serious mental health issues, right. but a substantial number of people have long-term consequences that they have to struggle with for a whole lifetime as a result of early victimization. And when I say early victimization, I don't mean just young children, I also mean adolescents. Right. And I think the statistics are at least half of the people that are sexually assaulted or under the age of, of 21 or 18. I mean, so we're talking about children and adolescents. Exactly. And in New Mexico, we are talking about um, a disproportionate number of males, which is unique. Mm -hmm. um, in comparison to other states. Um, we're also talking about the highest risk for victimization outside of children who are victimized in their homes is that college and high school mm -hmm. age range where people are vulnerable developmentally. That's a time in our lives when we're trying to figure out who we're going to be. And if somebody exploits our trust at that time period, it's very difficult to recover and it requires some very specific kinds of trauma-informed mental health care so that we can ensure that people then go on to have fewer consequences as a result of that experience. And New Mexico, I think, is number one in terms of mental health issues and in problems. So, I mean, it, one feeds into the other. Um, Let's talk about reporting because, I mean, you're talking about people that have been identified 
as victims and or survivors of sexual assault and they get help and there's all sorts of um, resources that can be extended to them. What about the individual and the majority of people do not report exactly. sexual assault. We know that. We don't know how many but it, it's said to be anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of people that are sexually assaulted don't report. What is being done to help them if anything? Let me start by explaining why that is, okay. um, because we do have a fair amount of information about why people don't report, and part of it is because people don't recognize the experience. We have this construct of what we believe sexual assault looks like, and that construct is wrong. Um, the majority of sexual assaults are not perpetrated by strangers. Mm -hmm. They don't involve weapons. They don't involve being jumped in um, a back alley. Although that happens, that is not the majority of uh, um, sexual assault experiences. So people who have experiences where their trust is betrayed and where they are at home with a friend, with a neighbor, um, these are the kinds of scenarios that are much more common. This is the vast majority of people who have this experience. And it's confusing. It's not what we expect. So survivors are in their homes trying to figure out what the heck just happened. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. I know it was horrible. Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily know that what happened to me is a crime. I don't know that there's anybody that can help me with this. Because it's not something that I'm going to call rape. And so it takes a period of time to understand that experience. And as a prosecutor, you know yeah. that that period of time is a very critical time in terms of being able to gather evidence, being able to nail down witness statements, mm -hmm. being able to figure out exactly how could I prove this crime. But the problem then is that the survivor, or at that point maybe the victim, is trying to figure out what the heck just happened. Mm -hmm. So our system is not really set up for this kind of crime, to respond to this kind of crime, because the, the individual's experience of the crime is too confusing for them to be able to recognize that there might be a way to get help for it. Right, okay. And, and I could see if they're testifying and they're confused about whether or not it's a crime, <laughs> They're not going to be a good witness for the state. I mean, it's going to hurt their cases. We know that the majority of people don't report. You, you um, talked about the myths, some of the myths that we think that rape is something that happens in the back alley with a stranger, where in fact, what, 80% or more of the time it's with someone that they know someone that possibly they trust, a family member, a friend, something like that. We also um, know that statistically it, it, it's going to happen in, in your home or the offender's home. Exactly. Right? And so those, again, are kind of those mis mixed messages. Now, when you prosecute a case, we do know, and we saying is the, um, usually the, the physical, uh, a nurse unit that comes in and that does the physical examination um, so that they can collect evidence. But they operate, what, 120 hours after the fact? And so after that, evidence can't be collected or very limited evidence can be collected. And as a prosecutor, you need evidence. Um, obviously beyond a reasonable doubt. And this process usually takes about, in Bernalillo County, at least a year and a half right. from the time of indictment. So there may be a delay from the time it occurs to the time it's reported to the time we bring formal charges, and then a year and a half later. And that's a huge um, chunk of time for someone to invest in, in something that's so traumatic and that they're dealing with a, a reasonably insensitive system. I mean, exactly. Let's, let's be real. I, th I think it's important for your viewers to know that medical care is available outside the window right. of 120 hours. Um, 120 hours is when we expect that there might be some physical evidence right. on the body. Right. Um, but there are other kinds of evidence that are probably still available after that time period. So your viewers shouldn't hear that message as, you know, don't bother no, if it's been outside no. of the 120 right. Um, hours. Right. But, but you're right, there is, there are quite a number of obstacles, which doesn't mean that it's not worth pursuing the individual case, um, but I think it's also important to be realistic, and particularly if you're a potential juror and you're presented with information about a case. Delay is typical, as we've already mm -hmm. mentioned why, um, and the kinds of evidence that you can more reasonably expect is um, testimony that corroborates or um, sort of micro-corroborates 
individual parts of a survivor's narrative of what happened. Um, so that's the kind of evidence that can be collected later. So it is possible um, to do cases where the survivor doesn't go immediately to police, um, but of course it presents pretty significant yeah. challenges. In, and we in, have to in terms of, pro and this happens with children. This is sure. very common with children all the way on up to adults. Sure. And I think that a lot of um, women, like you said, they, they don't understand and they don't want to see themselves as a victim. They don't want to believe that it happened to them. Sure. And they're trying to work that out in their mind. Another myth is that um, there's usually physical um, beatings, blood, broken teeth, things of that nature that if a person's truly um, raped that she would fight and defend herself and that there would be all sorts of physical injuries that would substantiate that. Right, exactly. And, and I think the way to understand that is if you can imagine being physically attacked by someone who knows a great deal about you. This is someone um, who is betraying your trust, has some kind of relationship with you, and they're utilizing that knowledge of you against you. Mm -hmm. So partners, um, dates, people who know you and profoundly betray you, um, those are the people that we're talking about as potential perpetrators. And, and I, I don't want your viewers to think that I am saying that you should be suspicious of everyone, because right, that's right. certainly not the case. These are um, a very small percentage of the population that are committing these crimes, and they're much like any other kind of criminal. There's a small percentage of our population that's harming a large percentage of our population, and, and if we can focus on those small numbers of serial offenders, then we can really do some significant overtures in terms of controlling this crime. Um, the individual survivor who makes the choice to report, um, I just want to say to that person, thank you, because you've already been harmed by this person and you're taking on protecting the rest of us from that person. And those of us who work in the system get it, that that's a huge burden to take on. It's a very difficult system to go through. Um, and the fact of the matter is the system is designed to test your reality. Mm -hmm. That's really what mm -hmm. figuring out what really happened in the criminal justice system is about. It's challenging the survivor of this violent act's reality. And that's a very difficult thing psychologically to take on at that moment. You experience this trauma that's life-changing for most people. And then you take on protecting the rest of us. It's really a very courageous right. act. And that's what most of them say why they go through it, um, is I don't want it to happen to anyone else. I mean, that's sure. the line you always get, I don't want it to happen. I'm doing it because I don't want him to do it again. Sure. And, and they really are, are reaching out to, um, to help any other potential victim out there. Um, what about the support that someone gets from family members and friends after they report a sexual assault? Well, so one of the purposes of having this conversation is to help the community understand this crime. And one of the things that we hear over and over again from survivors is that people who are close to them, people who love them, don't understand what happened and find themselves blaming the survivor for some aspect or another of the assault, something risky that perhaps the survivor might have done. And just be clear that everyone has the right to take some risks in their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, as a woman, I'm allowed to go have a drink. I'm allowed to go on a date. I'm allowed to wear something short. None of those things have anything to do with whether or not I have the right to say no to a particular kind of sexual contact. And we get those things all mixed up. And it happens throughout our society. So of course, the people who are close to a survivor have those same ideas, and mm -hmm. they have that same concept in their minds of what a sexual assault is like. And they're wrong about what a sexual assault is, uh, is like. In many ways, we try to project sort of a common sense idea that we've fabricated for ourselves. And that idea comes from our desire to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that we are not as safe as we want to be. Mm -hmm. And so we've constructed this false reality of this stranger with a knife in the alley, and all I have to do is stay away from that person. And the truth is really something very different. So 
survivors can't always count on the people close to them, and that's why it's so important to have community resources of people who know the research and understand the dynamics of this crime. If you could imagine um, somebody saying to someone who's just back from Afghanistan, oh, I know exactly what you feel like. Yeah. It's ridiculous. We would never say that to a combat veteran. And yet we sort of try to put ourselves psychologically into the shoes of somebody who's been through an experience that being a combat veteran and being a rape victim have practically nothing in common except that the way that that's internally experienced yeah. actually has it's been fair. identified as being really similar. Right. Huh. Sexual assault survivors have flashbacks, unwanted yeah. memories yeah. of things that are triggered suddenly, um, just like you've seen in bad Rambo movies. Yeah. Um, that's the internal experience of having been violated sexually. So what if somebody is a, a victim of sexual assault and they don't know what they want to do. They don't exactly understand what happened, but they feel that something horrible happened. Where do they go? Who do they talk to? And how do they get help to decide what may be best for them? So I believe that there are three things that are pretty critically important in the immediate aftermath. Um, one is to get appropriate mental health care. And it doesn't matter if you believe that you're fine Mm -hmm. um, just mm -hmm. to have somebody to talk to who understands this issue is critically important. So calling the Rape Crisis Hotline, which is 505-266-7711. And that's a 24-hour hotline. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, calling that hotline and speaking to someone who's trained can help you have information about your options and get you some appropriate emotional support at any time of the day or night. Um, the other thing that I think is really critically important is to take care of your physical body. Um, and to do that, I highly recommend seeking out SANE care. Um, and SANE stands for Sexual Assault Nurse Examiners. They're specially trained nurses who do just this kind of work, and they understand the traumatic aspect and the physical needs. Um, so calling for assistance from SANE is the other aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third thing that I would suggest to people is that they access our services. Um, we are an independent legal service, and we do nothing but serve sexual assault survivors, and we can help people understand the, all of the legal options. And there are a lot of different routes you can take. There's administrative aspects, there's civil possibilities, there's criminal possibilities. It can go in lots of different directions and we can advise people about all of their options so that they can have a background in figuring out which, which way they want to go with the case. Okay, now some people listening to this are going to say, you know, there's a lot of women that cry rape. And that's why they're confused about it because it didn't happen. And, you know, it, it's messing up the whole system when these women cry rape and, and it, it makes everybody unbelievable. Statistics show that that's a very, very small, what, less than 4% um, that they can identify, it may even be less than that, um, of people that, would, that are in that category, right? You're right, and this is a very significant issue. We have defended so hard against the possibility of a false report that we are skeptical about the vast majority of people mm -hmm. who are making authentic, real reports of violent crimes. And we can't continue like that as a community. Um, this, this particular area has been researched very heavily, particularly in countries where all of the criminal justice data is centralized. Mm -hmm. So Australia and Britain in particular have done a lot of research in this area. And there is some um, US research as well. And, and basically what it says is that 4 to 6 percent of all sexual assault reports are false. And what that means is that we've defended against this issue for, right. with so much vigor that we are really ignoring these serial offenses that are violent that have long-term impact on so many people in our society. And we just, we can't continue in that way. We have to sort of reorganize our thinking. The, the kind of false reporting that's more common in criminal justice systems is theft. Um, and the reason that there's a lot of false reporting with regard to theft is because people are going to scam their insurance yeah, companies. Right. And we don't defend against yeah, that yeah, nearly as hard yeah, as we yeah. defend against false reports of sexual assault. Yeah. Um, now, I don't want to be misunderstood. False reports happen. 
right. and they are devastating to the person who is um, accused of a false report. So those allegations need to be investigated. Um, but that's the problem in terms of this sort of community view that there's a lot of false reports is that one of the things that's been um, illuminated through the research is that different categories of characterizing reports have been uh, collapsed so that if you don't have um, enough leads to, to close a case, mm -hmm. um, if a survivor decides they can't go forward anymore right. and says, you know, I have to stop, those get sort of collapsed into that category. But if you tease out exactly what each kind of case is, it's a very small very number. small percentage. In prosecuting rape cases, we deal with jurors. Sure. Jurors in the last 10 years, um, since CSI, 12 years, 13 years, have become so demanding. And the burden of proof, I used to say, meant 75, 25, maybe, the state had met as burden. Um, now I think it's like 99.9% .9 in, in some cases. Um, they want everything. In, in rape cases, you don't have everything. Often you have two people, he and she, most, most often. Um, you have no physical evidence, really, other than possibly um, that, that sex occurred, but whether or not it was consensual is, is what it is, is at issue. And then you have a jury saying, well, you know, she was dressed, she was out partying. Um, she went to the guy's house, she had been drinking, maybe they smoked a little bit of dope. And, you know, they were dancing and whatever happened, happened. You know, we're not going to convict on that. Um, that's a consensual situation. These are things as prosecutors that we deal with all the time. And, and these are things, and we've dealt with victims that we believed that they were truly victims of sexual assault. We believe the evidence is good. A jury will hang or acquit because we haven't met that 99.9%. .9%. And I say that somewhat, um, you know, generally speaking, but, but I believe that's almost the standard in some cases. Um, and, and they're so critical of the victim and not critical of the accused. It, it, it just is very frustrating. And, and one of the reasons, too, why we're doing is this show is to educate the public and, and let them know about the dynamics and what's going on. And I do believe we have a segment of people that, that say if she was out drinking, if she was dressed that way, if she went to his house, she consented, no matter what happened. Right. So this is um, an uphill battle, um, but I think it's important to identify a number of different things that um, jurors should pay attention to. One of the things that I think is critical to think about is, just as a community, is assent is affirmative. Uh, consent right. is affirmative. It's not something that you imply from silence. It's not something that you apply imply from a lack of resistance. Consent is something that is affirmatively stated or that is non-verbally clearly communicated. This is not a really complicated mm -hmm. analysis for the offender to figure out whether or not there's consent. Um, so jurors need to hear there's some sort of affirmative consent that was communicated. Um, the other thing that I think is important for jurors to understand is when they're trying to evaluate credibility, there's a lot of ways to do that. And I think it's important for us to look at how we analyze evidence. Um, CSI is like Disneyland. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> nobody has that kind of resource. Nobody in New Mexico gets funded like that. Uh, you know, I'm a former, as you know, yeah. I'm a former prosecutor too. And we did a rape case where we had to do hair analysis. And the night before we were supposed to put on our hair analyst, the, um, one of the television programs, I can't remember whether it was CSI, had a, a hair analyst on the show. And so all our jurors saw this, this hair analyst, and the hair analyst gave an hour when the yeah, yeah. drug was administered. And we came into the courtroom the next day saying, oh my God, our, our expert is going to be able to say a month when this yeah, is done. Yeah. It's just, it's fantasy. So we're not going to present cartoon information to jurors. And jurors need to understand that they're going to have to really engage with the evidence and evaluate what co what's corroborated and what isn't corroborated. Um, similarly, 
investigators need to take on the responsibility of sort of doing that micro corroboration and really testing people's statements so that if somebody says it, it happened while such and such a television program was going on in the background, then find out yeah. if that television was program on. was going on in the background. If that detail is right, it seems more likely that what they're describing is right. Um, so d really doing that micro corroboration is essential, even though it seems like, it, well, it's not really an element we have to prove, but you know, consent is something that is not a big surprise that that's going to be raised. So proactively, the investigator needs to take that on and figure out what kind of evidence is there that there was no consent. If somebody has long-term traumatic reactions after a sexual contact, likelihood is that that was a traumatic event. Yeah, I, it's not a consensual event if you have nightmares about it and you wake up screaming yeah. in the middle of the night and your husband can say, she wakes up screaming in the middle of the night about a guy with his hands on her throat. I mean, there's yeah. all kinds of ways that you can work around the fact um, that there was nobody there but those two people. Um, similarly, one of the things that we know about these offenders is that they tend to have more than one victim. And although we can't try those cases together if we identify them, that makes it much more likely yeah. that it's going to be resolved. Right. If, if I have nine victims coming forward, the defense attorney is going to want it some kind of deal. With the same, with the same uh, method, the same scenario, I mean, that's, that's key to knowing something's going on. And this individual knows right. that he's committing wrong. And I, and I think that that's real important. So. You know, you're working from your perspective. We have the SANE um, group that's working. Everybody's got a, a little piece of the puzzle. Our office prosecutes. We've got law enforcement that investigates these cases. Sure. Everybody plays such an important role. And I always talk about our partnerships and trying to increase understanding and communication. And even if a sexual assault victim says, you know what, I need help, but I don't want to prosecute. Mm -hmm. Sure, and that's really common. And like I said before, frankly, I think it's a real act of courage right. to take on going through the um, criminal justice process. It's not designed to assist healing. Um, if I am sexually assaulted, it's really not helpful no. to me to have someone saying, mm, I'm not sure I believe you, at sort of every step. Even if it's not said directly, that's, right. that's the essence of testing credibility. Um, so people who take that on are really taking it on for all of us. But our collaborative effort means that people can make choices about what parts of the system they want to utilize. And it's important for survivors who've lost the ability to control their autonomy during the assault um, to be able to make those choices post-assault to begin to recover. So at every step of the way, individual survivors have choices. And that's part of why we're here, is to help people know what those choices are and to make informed decisions. And that's why your office has such great victim advocates to keep people informed right. so that they can. And we've indicted cases that, that the victim, you know, after in preparation for trial says, I can't do this, mm -hmm. where we've had to back up mm -hmm. and we've had to honor what, the, what was in the best interest of the victim and, and really what they wanted. You know, we've got a couple of minutes to wrap up. What, you know, we're doing this show really to educate the public to try to get them involved and make them more aware. What if somebody comes to you and says, I want to know what more I can do. I want to be part of the solution. What advice would you give them? I think it's really critical to be informed on this issue. You know, you are selected as a juror based on having a New Mexico driver's license. And the prosecution and the criminal justice system and our community depend on you um, to be thoughtful about this process and to not assume that just common sense is all that's needed in order to understand these cases. So that's one thing. The other thing is all of us know somebody who needs support after this kind of experience. And if you communicate that you've learned a, bit, a little bit about this to people who are close to you, people will begin to disclose to you that they've had this experience. Trust me, people are disclosing to me all the time. And the more that you communicate that you are open to hearing about this, um, the more that you'll hear about this issue. Thirdly, I think it's really critical that people who've had this experience access the support and help so that they are able to heal appropriately. If you want to do something about this issue, please contact the Rape Crisis Center. And um, you can volunteer with the Rape Crisis Center. You can be a, a hotline advocate. 
and we can also use additional volunteers to help with other kinds of volunteer activities. So please call the Rape Crisis Center to Okay. Help. Thank you, Claire, very much, and thank you for the work that you do. And hopefully we'll be making some headway on this. This is very critical. It impacts a huge number of people in our community, has a huge economic impact, our children and everything. So we certainly do appreciate the contribution you're making. I'm Carrie Brandenburg. Thank you for joining us. I'm working on your behalf.